Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is being recorded um, for YouTube, but it's also being shown live on, on YouTube as well. So today's webinar is to give you an insight into the Council's financial recovery plan. We need to do this to try and mitigate as best possible the dramatic loss in revenue, which is a direct consequence. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is being recorded. Um, so my apologies there for another bit of uh, echo. So the dramatic loss in, in revenue, which is a direct consequence of the both the council's and the country's response to address the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to introduce you to the panel. So I have Councillor Richard Samuel, who is the Deputy Council Leader and also Cabinet Member for Finances. I also on today's panel have um, uh, the Chief Executive, Will Godfrey. Good afternoon. And also uh, Director of Finance, Andy Rothery. Good afternoon. So I'd now like to, to ask Andy to go through the income and expenditure and ask if we could have uh, the slides three and four on the screen. So start with slide three, thank you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start explaining um, really what I'm intending on doing is giving a overview of the, the cost of expenditure across the council services. So um, what we will be having is a pie chart that shows this in a very simple way. So our council's revenue expenditure budget is £352 million. Pounds. Uh, thank you, Mark. So break, breaking this down simply across the pie chart, so I've got four areas here. So starting on the top left, we have our corporate budgets. So within this, this is 83 million pounds, which is a large number. The majority of this, or at least half of it, is in our, um, our tariff payment we made to government for um, business rates that we collect. And also within our corporate budget areas, we have um, a lot of our corporate services like customer services, our revenues and benefits services. And this is also where we fund our capital financing from. So it's where we pay for the, the borrowing costs of all of the investment, um, capital investment across the region. So moving clockwise onto the next section, um, our adults, children's and public health services cost us 144 million pounds. And you know, these are our key services that um, support the vulnerable across the region. Also within here, um, we do make a number of commissions on behalf of the, the NHS because we operate um, shared budgets with the NHS. So we also have health services that are funded from here. Now, moving around to the next um, section, we have 49 million of um, expenditure that's for services that um, are paid from the dedicated schools grant. So this is where the council administers payments to the schools through the retained element of the dedicated schools grant, which is 49 million. And finally, that brings us on to the last section, which is 76 million. Uh, these are classified as services to the public. There's a wide range of services in here that include areas such as highways, refuse collection, street cleansing, parks and housing services, amongst a number of others. So hopefully that gives everyone an overview of the, the cost of running a council, which is £352 million. Pounds. So Mark, could you take me on to slide four, please? Uh, this slide shows how we pay for those services. So I think a lot of people often think council tax and business rates pay for the whole council, but that's just a part of how we fund our services. So starting with council tax and business rates, you can see that's a large area, that's 160 million. But within that, the, the tariff payment back to government is in there. So part of that is in the expenditure also. Right, moving again clockwise, we are reliant on a number of government grants. So in external funding, and charges. We have um, um, we have the children's services grants, the public health grants in there, and we also have adult services grants. And in that area, there's also the money that pays for the services we um, commission on behalf of the NHS. And moving around further, we have three areas that I'd say they're very unique to Baines, where we generate a lot of income through fees and charges. So we have our parking, 
Roman baths and heritage services income and commercial estate income. So these three areas equate to 66 million of income. We're reliant on to fund our services, um, which we do have a high reliance on an external income in Bath. Now moving around a little bit further, we have other income, which is really a range of discretionary income areas across the council that are smaller amounts and also some payments that come back from governments like new homes bonus and we also get reimbursed for expenditure from government under the section 31 grants and then finally we have the the school's dsg grant funding there's a pass through so that's the same amount as the the money we administer um, and pay to the schools so that that really covers everything in terms of explaining the numbers i think hopefully this shows that um you know the council is a large organization and does have a range of different um, funding sources that we rely on to fund a range of services that we provide to our residents. So, Mark, could you go on to the next slide? And I'm going to um, hand over to Richard. Thank you. I'd like uh, Richard now to, to just give us a bit of a flavour about the pressures uh, that uh, the, the council faces. Thank, thank you, Dina. Um, well, the first thing to say is uh, we're by no means unique. Uh, pretty well every council in the country is facing financial problems caused by COVID in one way or another. Um, what makes our position very different is that we, we reckon we are the um, highest dependent unitary authority on, it, on externally generated income. So what that means is we, we generate more external income uh, than pretty well any other council of a comparable type. So that, that's the reason we have particular problems here relative to the size of our budget. And just to give on the slide there, we've got a couple of numbers that uh, show you how dramatic this has been. Uh, so the first one compared with um, 2019 um, income uh, from April, May this year and April, May in 2019 has dropped by 5.6 million. And uh, it doesn't take a genius to see if you project that forward through the rest of the financial year, uh, some very big numbers come from that. And we'll just go on to those in a second. And just to give you a sense of the way that money is leaching away, it's uh, 91,000 pounds a day, 14% um, of our, our spend on services. So money is hemorrhaging away because of the uh, effectively choking off of, uh, of our income sources. And our recovery is entirely dependent on what the government decides to do in terms of the release of the lockdown over the next uh, three to six months. So that, that's a little bit of context. We go on to the next slide. So that, just to show everybody how this breaks down, um, the most dramatic loss, of course, has been from heritage income, and that is principally the Roman baths, the pump rooms, and the assembly rooms, and other uh, properties that we uh, charge for access to. And that's the biggest loss of all, because, of course, the baths has had to be closed um, from March uh, and until it opens in a few weeks' time. And even when it does reopen, it will be operating on a substantially reduced footfall. Uh, parking income um, has dropped dramatically. We will expect that to recover more so than the other sources because uh, as business gradually returns to our urban areas, uh, we will see people paying for parking again. So, but we still expect to lose 7.2 million this year. Uh, the other big one, which I, I have no doubt will come up this evening, is the loss of income from the council's commercial estate. And it's just important to say what that means, uh, what it covers. It's not all retail properties in Bath City Centre. The council has a wide range of commercial property across Bath and North East Somerset, and it has been affected in different ways depending on the businesses that are renting from us. Um, however, the coronavirus uh, problem has hit uh, at a time when the retail sector was struggling anyway because of competition from online shopping and so on. So uh, that estate has been under a lot of pressure and we expect to lose uh, over six million pounds this year in income that we would have otherwise had. 
Uh, the other losses of income are more minor, but they are to do with things like planning applications, which have reduced substantially this year. Um, so when you add to that income loss and you also look at increased expenditure because, because we have had to, um, excuse me, we have had to also spend more on social care needs, particularly protective equipment. Um, that leads us to a deficit this year that we're expecting to be in the region of 42 million pounds. And what one has to bear in mind is that so far, the central government has only reimbursed the council uh, by um, just about 10 million pounds. And that's taken into account in that figure. So the, the deficit would have been 52 million pounds, but we have received 10 million pounds from the government. So it is a pretty bad situation and we've had to take emergency action to um, restore our finances to a sustainable position. And perhaps we'll come on to say a bit more about that um, as we move through this webinar. So I think I'm handing over to Will Thank now. you, Richard. Thank you. And yes, I'd like our Chief Executive to just, um, you know, just talk a bit about our response and the measures that we've taken so far. Okay, thank you, Dina. If we can maybe go on to the last slide, Mark, please. Um, okay, so I think just let me just begin by giving some sort of context. Um, so I, for my sins, I've been sort of in and around local government uh, for the last sort of 30 odd years. I was a finance director in a, you know, in my previous life before I became the chief executive a while ago. Um, and it's really important to, you know, to understand that, that this, these are really unprecedented times. I, I've never known in all of that time a challenge of the scale that we've got now. I think the other thing that is important to recognize is that um, it's often, it's often uh, very tempting to just, to just compare local authorities to each other. And you know, at a simplistic level then sort of say, well, if, if one authority is able to do this, why, why aren't, aren't we able to do exactly the same thing? And I think what we've, what we've tried to show in this presentation is some of the specific issues that relate to Bath Authority Somerset, and particularly that issue about income, the level of income that we've that we've lost, which is unlike virtually every other local authority in uh, certainly in England. Um, now you may well ask why that's the case, and that there's you know we'll, we'll hopefully talk about that over the next period, but we have to face we have to deal with the reality of where we are. Um, as opposed to what we hope might be the position we're in. And as, uh, as other panellists have explained, our, our projected deficit at the moment in this financial year is £42 million. And it is important to, to, to stress that that's the position at the moment. So this doesn't take account of any increased cost around maybe some additional uh, second spike infection, any costs that go around that. This is th these, are, these are real costs and real loss of income that we've that we've uh, experienced so far, so we can't just sit here and go. Well, we hope over the next few months everything will be okay, and you know perhaps we'll get a bit more more money from government. We have a we have a legal duty to balance our budget within the financial year. Now, again, you may argue whether or not you think that's right, that's wrong. Um, other parts of the public sector don't have to do that. That's the reality of the position. That we face, so we we as, as as senior council officers have to work with elected politicians to then say, okay, well, if that's the position we're facing, how do we how do we now work throughout the rest of this financial year to find a solution to the challenge that we find ourselves in? So people will have, will have seen over the last last sort of um, a couple of months that the government have given some money to local authorities. So they've given around three point two billion pounds across uh, all 343 local authorities across England. Our share of that is around 10 million pounds. So you can see that then reduces our challenge from 42 million down obviously to 32 million. Um, but again, that, that is still a significant amount of, of money that essentially we, we would be losing. So we've, we've had to work now over the last few weeks to understand um, what mitigations we can we can we can we can make in this financial year 
to ensure we can balance the budget. And there are two, there are two elements of that. One is in an in year saving programme that was published last week that will be uh, discussed uh, by the council this week, uh, by cabinet on Thursday, to agree uh, that, that package of measures to put in place. We're also then uh, assuming at the moment, because obviously uh, to find 30 odd million pounds worth of savings from a 118 million pound budget within the financial year is a huge challenge. And we're very conscious that what we don't want to do is to is to take so much money out of out of the budget that affected that has a significant impact on on service delivery and services that people uh, people are receiving. So at the moment we are making an assumption that we are going to be using just over just over eleven million pounds worth of reserves uh, that the council holds to be able to balance the budget. Now that is a significant element of the reserves that we would be using to essentially balance this year's budget, and that's not a sustainable position going forward. So I think you know, hopefully, what we're what we're trying to do today is to just explain the context, explain the challenge, and to start having that conversation so that our communities and everybody understands that this isn't this isn't a this isn't something that we can unfortunately that we can just wish away. This is a real challenge, uh, with you know, with 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 significant consequences that we have to address, and we have to address uh, as soon as we can. And I think that's probably all I need to say to begin with. Dina. Thank you very much, Will. So I'm now going to uh, move on to some of the questions that we've already had uh, sent in. So what I'll do is I'll read the, the question and then invite the, one of the pan panellists to make, make a start on, on answering that question. So one question that we have from Jeremy, Jeremy uh, Labran is, um, uh, so it picks up on a point I think you made, Will, which is, he says, I have repeatedly heard that central government allocate funding and we just have to get what we're given. How hard are we negotiating for Baines's specific needs and priorities? And how can you demonstrate that? And how can the community add weight to the representations Baines makes to central government? So quite a, a long, uh, well, lots of parts to that question. Yes. Yeah, so let me let me let me just sort of tackle that head on. So it was it became pretty clear towards the middle to end of March that we were going to be facing a very serious um, uh, situation. So we've been in conversation with the Ministry of, House, of Housing, Local Government and Communities um, since the end of March. Um, you know, the leader of councils had 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 conversations uh, politically. I've had conversations with officers along with Andy and we've you know we we've, we've we've been having those conversations as I say all the way since uh, uh, since the end of March um, and you know that those those conversations are uh, really focusing on the fact that we've got a very different challenge to most of the authorities so so this thing specifically about um, you know our our reliance on income, compared to other authorities. Um, so those conversations continue. Um, you will have heard Robert Jenrick in the House of Commons last week talking about bringing forward what they what he's described as a comprehensive financial solution for local government. We're still waiting to see uh, when that will take place. We've had conversations with both our MPs to urge them to, to obviously use their channels of communication. Um, and we had a we had another conversation with um, with Vera about last week. We had a conversation with Jacob Rees Mogg, probably the last one, two or three weeks ago. So we've we've had numerous conversations. In terms of what our communities can do, I would urge you to to to, to write to your MPs, um, you know, to make sure that they understand that actually this is this is a very serious position that we're in, and as much pressure we can bring to bear. On, on on the government through MPs and through you know through contacting uh, um, uh, media channels etc. All of that helps. Uh, what I would urge people to do is to talk about the specific circumstances that we're facing, because you know our challenge relative to say Bristol 
is significantly greater. Um, it, as a proportion of our budget, the challenge we've got is about a third. Um, there is no other council, certainly in the, you know, in the um, uh, close geographical area that's, that's anything like that. The only other places that get near that are places like Luton, who bought an airport and therefore their income is down. There are probably three or four councils that are, I suppose, of a of a uh, of a um, similar sort of position. Although we are probably even of those three or four, we're probably the worst of all of them. So yeah, I would urge everybody to you know to pick pick your pick your pen up. Um, if that's that's probably an old thing to do nowadays. Probably get on your keyboards, write you know write to your MPs, help us to to get that message across and ensure that we get the funding that we need. But in the meantime, we have a responsibility to make sure that the budget balances and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. And actually, in answering that, that question, you've uh, answered one of the, the first uh, questions that had come in about, uh, you know, what, um, how are our two MPs working with us uh, uh, to, to address this this issue um so one thing actually i would like to just add you know don't just write to your mps if you want to write to the chancellor of the exchequer if you want to write to the prime minister you know please do so uh, you know as um i was going to say every little helps but uh, that might be that might be a brand that i'm not supposed to mention at this moment um so the next question is from again from from jeremy jeremy uh, and his question starts with savings, yet again required, no doubt. But can the deficit be converted into a low interest debt to be paid off over five years? You know, and I think this is a question and similar questions about, you know, why we can't just sell off, uh, uh, you know, buildings and things. You know, I think is a, uh, you know, I think would be really useful to to get some clarity over this. I'm going to start with Andy on that question. Okay, thanks, Dina. So Andy, this, did you hear the question? I, I did, yeah. So thanks. Um, so at the moment, we, we can't um, accrue a deficit and, and also, you know, treat it like a loan. We have to fully fund our revenue position. So our 2021 revenue budget um, in the event of an overspend, and we are forecasting a significant overspend, that needs to be fully funded. Hence our, our work on financial recovery plans to try and manage down expenditure. So with lower expenditure as our income levels reduce. And then also we need to explore ways to finance that deficit. So there's a reliance on council reserves. So when we utilise reserves, that's money that's one off. Is once it's used, we've funded that deficit fully. But if we do overuse our reserves, we have to um, factor in it in future financial plans how we'll replenish those reserves because a number of our reserves are needed for financial planning purposes um, for setting our future year's budget. So at the moment, under our local government accounting regs, we can't um, have a deficit converted into a loan. Similarly, we, we can't sell a load of assets to generate cash to fund our deficit because that's mixing our accounting policies around capital and revenue. Assets can be sold to um, reinvest in capital expenditure, but assets can't be sold to um, release money into our revenue accounts. So that's something that we, we can't do. And, and at the moment, I think it'd be quite a high risk thing to do also around um, valuation of assets. So that's where we are in you know, conversations with governments around grant funding to help our revenue position. So I hope that helps. Thank you. And actually, this is a question, perhaps Richard, you could also uh, come in on. So another uh, question that is asked a lot is why we can't or appear to be unwilling to um, give uh, sort of free rent periods to uh, businesses. Uh, perhaps that's something you could answer? Yeah, I mean, this is this has come up a lot really um, over the last um, couple of months. The, the problem we have, and I think probably uh, the figures that we've shown on the slides demonstrate, is that um, there's nothing technically impossible about giving uh, rent-free periods, except that it feeds straight through 
to the bottom line in terms of the income that we were, we now won't be getting. And as I said at the beginning, this, this is around six million pounds at the moment. Um, giving rent discounts across the board to our tenants would increase that amount substantially. And all it would do is to make our recovery position even more difficult than it already is. Um, one of the things I did the other week was to check whether our, the approach that we're adopting, which is to um, discuss with individual tenants uh, their rent position and any difficulties they're having and allow them to um, defer rent payments on the basis that those payments are made ultimately over a longer period of time. Um, we've checked to see if that is a consistent approach across the country and it is. 80% uh, of councils are not granting rent-free periods and but they are allowing flexible arrangements to be negotiated on a one-to-one -one basis. So um, I think we're fairly consistent. We're also consistent in Bath City with the St John's Trust, who own around a third of properties in the, in the retail part of the city. Um, so we tried to do that. And bear in mind, um, I think you, it has to be counted that businesses have had a lot of assistance through the state funding routes over the last few months. Uh, the business grant scheme which we've administered uh, and uh, pretty well all the money that came to the council has now been distributed to businesses. A discretionary fund is operating to try and mop up some businesses who were unsuccessful because the government set the parameters for that scheme and of course all businesses have benefited from business rate holiday this year and many businesses will have benefited from the ability to furlough staff. The Chancellor said right at the beginning of this that it was not going to be possible to help every business in the country. And uh, I, we recognise that is unfortunately the reality. We have done our level best to try and get help to as many businesses as we can. And we've been, been particularly attentive to smaller businesses and independent businesses where we can as well. So I think we have gone probably as far as we're able to and um, certainly calls for rent-free periods will simply just make the problem that we're discussing tonight even worse. And it, I can assure you, uh, to get to the 20 million figure that uh, Will Godfrey referred to is a very painful process. If you add five, 10 million on top of that, it actually becomes impossible. So that, that's the reason behind it. We, we've been trying to balance out these two things. Um, and I hope that if there are businesses listening to this that have not got the help they want, that they do approach us and talk to our staff, uh, talk to myself or talk to Dina, and we, we will do whatever we can, but it will not include rent-free periods, unfortunately. Thank you, Richard, that's really helpful. Um, and I just want to raise a question uh, from the chat, because I don't know if the chat will appear on the YouTube, uh, either the recording or, or you know, as this is going out live now. Um, but I think it's actually quite a, an interesting question. So I'm going to read it out. It's from Martin Grixoni. Uh, and the question is, if we are a third down, what is the national norm so that we can make our bid realistic against that norm? And if government can borrow at these low rates, can we not bid to borrow against even our own extensive assets? So that, to me, this seems to fit quite well with the conversation that we're, ha we're having at this moment. So I was just going to ask Will if he would just sort of repeat the answer that he's already written um, uh, to, to, uh, to Martin. Yeah, so the two bits of that. So in terms of borrowing, we, we aren't allowed to borrow money to fund our day-to-day -day ongoing expenditure. Um, again, you might think that's right or wrong, but that's the, the, those are the rules and we, you know, uh, we have to deal with those. In terms of national norm, it's, it's a bit difficult to be to be precise, but you know, figures I've seen, I think people are, are between most people are between about ten and fifteen percent in terms of their their sort of percentages of budget down. So, uh, so at, you know, at thirty odd percent, you can see that we are in a very different different position. Um, so, yeah, that that just gives you a bit of context, which hopefully just reinforces. Uh, the situation that you know uh, that we're facing which is as I say very different from most other authorities. 
Thank you, Will. Now, I've got a, a question from our live question and answer uh, yeah. section, which is, it basically is picking up on the point that our central grant may be less proportionately than other councils, uh, presumably on the basis that we have heritage and other income that, does, that others don't. Uh, so it just really wants to check if that's right. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you know, if he's also right in uh, assuming that rather than work for us, it's conversely might work against us. Um, and is looking at an argument that the impact is greater on Bayes than other unitaries. Um, or are we seen as less needy than others? So I think it's just really unpicking a little bit more the point that's been raised about how much reliance we've had on our heritage services. And that question was um, raised by Christopher Mason. Uh, so I don't know who wants to start off on that. So I will ask Richard to start. Over the last 10 years, um, the, the, the old process of supporting council this expenditure all over the country with what was called revenue support grant um, has been phased out by the government. Uh, the, so the, the grants that councils used to get were based on very complex calculations, which we don't need to go into here, about need in the area, deprivation, uh, demands on services and so on. Over time, those have been those have largely disappeared, and the the amounts uh, I think this year is probably the last year we're due to have any of that distribution. So there isn't a, there isn't effectively a grant mechanism in place anymore. What has tended to happen is that uh, lots of the lots of that general support has been put either into specific grants for specific purposes. Um, or councils have been encouraged to try and generate their own income sources. And that is exactly what Bath and North East Somerset has done. Um, and uh, I suppose you could argue that we have been too, too successful at that, uh, that we now end up at the top of the pile of councils that generate our own income. Um, and what has been a terrific strength in many in, in previous years has now turned out to be, for the moment, a very big weakness. So there will be councils around the country who have very little reliance on external income because they don't generate any uh, or not very much. So it, it is a changing picture. Um, and one of the problems um, that this has exposed is that for a number of years now, um, our government has been talking about reforming local government finance and putting it on a more stable footing. And I'm afraid those, those uh, proposals have not yet come forward in any tangible form um, and that's made it particularly difficult for the government at the moment actually because uh, most councils haven't got that long-term stability that, that we the sector needs so it, it, that's a bit of a convoluted answer but it is quite a complicated uh, issue and it's not a case that we have lost grant uh, the grant was being taken away anyway by the government and uh, greater reliance on business rate income actually was what was being proposed in its stead. So I don't know if one of the, either Will or Andy wishes mm -hmm. to add to that, uh, Dean. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of start. I think it's the, yes. Yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, that, the income we generate, um, we've, as a council, always been very good at generating income and with through assets like the Raymond Baths, which is something we've become reliant on. Um, in terms of the, the government response to date on COVID, the grant allocation to support councils has be has used the standard allocation methodology. So that's whether it's by population or on a needs basis, looking at areas such as social care. So that's where um, as a council we're still really exposed because our government support that we've been given in terms of the grant doesn't reflect our income exposure. This is the key point that, um, as Will said earlier, we've been speaking to government about, um, specifically MHCLG, to make them very aware of this issue. So it is something that we've um, articulated right from the outset and will continue to do so to really you know, lobby government. So this is recognised in terms of any further funding response given to councils, because we can't um, suddenly drop our expenditure 
overnight to the magnitude of our income loss because that's something that's built up over years of us building our budgets and we're completely reliant on that income as I, I explained as we showed as I went through the pie charts earlier that's income that we're reliant on to fund the range of services so it is a point that we will continue to stress the government. Thank you Andy I don't know if there's anything else to add Will to that um, no, not particularly. I think that was a that was a very very full analysis of uh, of the position we're in. Okay, thank you. Now I'm now going to move to some of the other questions that we've had in, and some of these are a little bit more specific about uh, particular areas of um, of funding. So I have a, a question here from Ros Lambert, who's the chief executive of First Steps. So the, her question is, do the panel envisage a time when local authority financial planning will return to a pre-COVID-19 position and her specific earlier specialist funding will be reversed in the near future? Uh, can I ask Andy maybe to, to start with an answer on that one? Okay, this is a really good question, Roz. Um, in, in terms of um, financial planning, I, I think for us, we're, you know, we're really early on in terms of COVID and understanding the impact on our budgets. So our response at the moment is really focused on the short term and how we manage our budget and we manage the 2021 year, year end. But we are very mindful of the, the longer term impacts. I, I do anticipate um, this to continue for some time and um, throughout the next few months we will be getting into quite a bit of detail about how we reset our future year's budget. Um, but at, at the moment, in terms of our response and our um, financial recovery measures we put forward, the, these are one-off measures. They're very much around balancing the in-year budget. What we're not doing is proposing any recurrent budget cuts. So I think, was with your question, you know, as a council, we want to work with all of our providers and understand um, how providers are impacted and also work at, you know, how we can look at services and um other funding mechanisms, but as I said earlier, it's really early on in terms of understanding that long-term impact and how we need to think about recurrent changes in our budget. Okay, thank you. Dina, can I just come in there, perhaps? Can I... Thank you, and a similar, uh, yes, of course. Sorry, so, so I think, you know, I think one of, one of the sort of the issues that, are see, that has been going round and round and round for the, for the last 20, 30 years is obviously uh, the funding of adult care. And I think, you know, what, what this crisis has absolutely brought, uh, you know, full, full square is, is, is how that issue can no longer be ignored. Um, and, you know, I would say that, that whatever happens going forward, the government must, among you know, more than anything else, must address address the issue of funding for adult social care. For years and years and years, there's been studies about about the element of underfunding, um, and it is you know, and this, I'm not a politician, so it's not you know, this is not a political point. This is just about the basic funding of what is an absolutely pivotal uh, public service, and more than anything else, I would hope this crisis. Has brought to the fore the importance of that of that service and how absolutely imperative it is that adult social care is funded properly. Mm. I think, no, I I think could... we would all absolutely agree with that, uh, Richard. Yeah, I was just just add to that um, because one of the things that uh, the pandemic has shown is that in dealing with crises su such as such as one we've had the relationship between central government and local government and uh, the Department of Health and individual health trusts is crucial to successful, um, su successful service delivery on the ground. And it, it is a fact that had local government not been there and been able to function as, as with the colleagues in the health service, things would have been a lot worse. And we only have to look across the pond to uh, the mess that America is making of handling the pandemic. And it is in nobody's interest for the relationship, financial and otherwise, between central and local government to be weakened. It's really important 
that everybody recognizes that um, we are a key part of the state providing services at a local way in the, in the way that central governments can never ever do successfully. So that relies on something and that is a good relationship and a good funding settlement between the two parts of the state. And I think that's one of the things that is being tested quite a lot at the moment. Um, and we will, come, we will come out of this and we will see how, how it happens. But it is in nobody's interest for local government to emerge from this crisis irreparably financially weakened. It's, in, it's not in anybody's interest and it will have a long-term damage uh, to the state. So I think, you know, I come at it kind of from that way really. And I think just going back to the two MPs, I think both MPs understand that. And, and really get that point because we do not, uh, we can't do anything with our communities unless we have the money to do it. And we have to be able to raise that money or given, given that money to do things. When we are, we will do things well. Um, can I just make, a, a, just to add one thing though to um, the, the scale, the time of the recovery. Um, I have my own reasons for, well, I have my own basis for thinking that it's gonna be quite different depending uh, on what we're talking about. I think, for example, parking income will return relatively quickly, unfortunately, because I think there will be a move away from public transport, which is very unfortunate. The heritage income, I think, will take a lot longer to recover, possibly up to three years, um, because the I think we are going to see big reductions in international tourism, particularly over the next 12 months. And I don't know how persistent that will be. And then the commercial estate is actually going to take quite a long time to recover if it ever does, because the, um, the nature of our relationships with our tenants is that they're all in leases of varying lengths. And it's not possible to go from one system of um, uh, payment and tenant landlord tenant relationship to another quickly. It takes a while to unwind. So I think it's, these impacts are going to be with us for quite a few years. And um, when we do our financial planning over the next few years, we'll obviously have to take that into account. But I think it would be reasonable to say to people, um, this is probably not likely to return to pre-COVID levels for anything like three years or so. I think there's going to be a continuing impact, although over time, undoubtedly it will diminish. So I think it, it, it is quite a structural issue that we're, we're facing. Thank you, Richard. Actually, that leads quite neatly into a question from George Feiger. Um, and his question actually does ask that very, about the very issue about, you know, the old norm compared to the new future. Uh, so his question is, a key objective of the council is to reduce the amount of pollution in Bath. Lockdown has given us a taste of how much better the city is without it pollution and traffic, uh, including fume emitting buses. Going back to the old situation now seems even more appalling. The council measures the revenue loss from the reduction in traffic, parking charges and tourism, but the residents gain enormously in health and a more appealing city. So how does the council propose situation to address the pollution and traffic goals rather than going back to the previous mess well i think i think we knew Richard, we knew what you were you saying this <laughs> um yeah i'm um, not sure if you have it. no I, I i i think i've got the gist of it i mean the Richard, perhaps well did you hear the question yeah it's fine there's been a breakdown in technology. Well, oh, let, me, let, let me pick sorry, it. Sorry, there has been a breakdown in technology. My apologies. Let, let me pick up what, um, what's going to happen over the next few months. Um, the, so the first thing that is not going to be materially affected is the introduction of the clean air zone. Um, the government did put back the start date of that. Uh, we were hoping to start on the 4th of November. Um, but a couple of things have held that up. One, the government decided that it didn't want zones to come in this year. So they put back the 
start time to no earlier than the end of January 21. Um, so that's the first thing that has happened. The second thing that has happened is we have had to clarify some of the funding offer that they made to the council. Um, there were various things that uh, appeared to be unfunded that uh, we had expected to be funded, but I think we're reasonably close to finalizing that discussion with them. And um, in a few weeks, the cabinet will receive a report on the final position on that. But um, members of the public can expect the clean air zone to go live at the beginning of 2021. And that of course will introduce charging for high polluting vehicles entering the zone. Uh, and the work is going on on that. Uh, work should have started this week. I haven't been there to check, but uh, the, the work funded for Queen's Square should be restarting again this week. And the installation of the camera network is in progress. So that's the first thing to say. Uh, the second thing is that um, the, the questioner is absolutely right, of course. All of us have experienced a very different type of city. And uh, it was said that traffic levels went back to the levels of the 1950s uh, for, for a period of time. And I, I guess everybody found that very attractive for the time it was. But what it, what it has opened up actually is that on busy, on quieter roads, um, more and more people have been cycling and walking that perhaps weren't too keen to do so before. And that has exposed a big ap appetite among some parts of our population for people who want to do more of that. And, I, and we think that's a good thing. Um, so uh, Joe Wright, my colleague, is working very hard on trying to introduce uh, more, uh, more sustainable measures for the future around increasing cycling and walking use, but it is, it is quite a, a difficult process to negotiate with um, funding and um, the ability to alter road networks. It's quite a complicated task, but that is in hand. The other thing that is worth flagging up is that um, in a few weeks time, one of the council's uh, scrutiny panels, the environment panel, will receive a report on revamping the parking system uh, in, in Bath North East Somerset. And there are quite a wide ranging set of changes that are proposed. Uh, one of which is to introduce for the first time um, residence permits for parking based on the CO2 emissions of your vehicle. Uh, at the moment, we operate a flat rate scheme, doesn't matter what type of vehicle you have. Um, and we are intending if, if the consultation and the views on that are supportive to move to a system that uh, bases the charge more closely on the emissions of your vehicle. So put very simply, a very small vehicle, vehicle would pay a, a smaller charge and a very large vehicle that was very polluting would pay a higher one. And the charges have not been determined yet, but we think that it's a commitment which we made last year to cleaner air and less CO2 emissions. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what the public reaction is to that. So to just kind of summarise that, the council, although we have been knocked off course by events in recent months, we have not lost our long-term focus on trying to take actions that reduce CO2 emissions, um, because as everybody will know, uh, the climate emergency has not actually gone away. Uh, just people have forgotten about it for the moment. But I think people are starting to remember that there is a need to reduce CO2 emissions as a nation. And one of the biggest CO2 emission categories is, is motor vehicles. So we will be returning to this and, and, and it might be, Dina, that this is something we do uh, sp something specifically on in the coming months because there's a lot of interest in it. Yeah, I, I agree actually, and I'm happy to take that on board for a future webinar. Um, so another question that's come up is actually about the uh, community's uh, role in uh, working with us. Uh, two questions from uh, James Carlin, who's the director of 3SG, which is the third sector group. The first question from him is the multi-agency response to COVID-19 in Baines is rightly held up as an exemplar nationally. Given the success of our partnership, 
can we have confirmation that a portion of the £850,000 available from the government can be used to support the long term, -term future of the hub? Um, I don't know who would like to, to start off on that, but I would like to uh, say before I bring somebody else in that I would say that the, the partnership and the community's response, you know, the volunteers that have come forward have actually been excellent. And I'd just like to, to thank each and every one who has worked with us, um, as well as with Virgin Care as well, to uh, develop a, as, as James says, an exemplar, uh, ex you know, uh, example of a, a partnership that has delivered fantastically for for our community and all those that are the most vulnerable in that community. Um, Will, perhaps you would like to come in here? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that whole issue of the engagement with with community and partners generally has been has been really positive, and I think you know we're very keen. To, uh, to maintain as much of that as possible as we move forward. Um, and, you know, I think those sort of things, um, you know, those sort of things are a test for everybody because, because it is, it's working across organisational boundaries. I think sometimes people, you know, sometimes there is a cost to getting those sort of things up and running uh, to begin with. Uh, but actually, I think, you know, the benefit that you that, that we get from that, that in the long run is very significant. So certainly we want to keep looking at that. We want to keep exploring what those opportunities are to ensure that, that we can, you know, continue to engage communities and community groups um, and as many different stakeholders as possible. Um, one, so that people understand the challenge that we've got. But two, you know, as we go forward, we are going to have to do this differently. Um, so as people were saying before, I think, you know, our, our financial model um, has served us well at a time when the economy has been buoyant. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely brought, brought to, uh, to a head some of the vulnerabilities we have in more challenging times. So we do need to, to, to restructure the finances of the authority and engaging with communities and explaining that and working with different, different stakeholders and different partners will be an important part of what we're trying to do. Thank you, Will. And actually, uh, the, so there was a second question, as I said, which is uh, uh, from James, which is many third sector organisations are being asked to make in-year budgetary savings and longer term revisions to contracts. And the sector wants to support Baines Council on shaping the strategy. But can we provide assurances that our current funding will be protected and contracts will remain secure? So clearly, we want to do as much of that as possible. Uh, it's very difficult to give cast iron guarantees when we when we are working in very uncertain environment ourselves. Um, so the, the you know the spending review, uh, the much more spending review, we don't know when that's when that's going to be. We don't know yet um, what what the period of our financial settlement will be from government. I suspect that the the last last three or four months has made. Uh, the likelihood of that of that going ahead to that original timescale probably even more unlikely. Um, so, you know, I think the key to it for me is, is to have honest open conversations with where we are. We want to maintain those relationships and those contracts as much as possible, but hopefully everybody will understand that the circumstances we find our, ourselves in now are very different to the circumstances we were facing in, in, in February and March. Um, so, you know, we can't give guarantees, but, but, but we're absolutely clear that our commitment is we want to work effectively with everybody. Absolutely. And I, I would just echo that because the council really does value the massive contribution that the sector has played in supporting all of our residents, um, you know, across Bath and North East Somerset. Um, and again, I'll just say thank you again to everybody that has played their part in that. Uh, I've got a couple of other questions. So one question which is related to this area is around the eight years of austerity and whether or not that will have an impact on our capacity for, for savings. Um, so I don't know, perhaps Richard, you might like to uh, come in on, on that question. Well, it's, it's certainly the case that, um, uh, like pretty well all councils, the, the this council has had to continue to make economies and efficiencies and savings over the years. Um, and it gets harder every 
yeah, uh, it's not easy uh, at the best of times. So it, it has made things more difficult, but I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure I, I completely paint this into that scenario because one of the things that um, the pandemic has shown us is that actually the council is capable of working in an entirely different way to the one pe the people had got very used to. Um, I, I mean, Will has made the point to us on many occasions that we've had, what, 1,500 staff working from home using technology such as this, not always worked as perfectly as one would like, but that has actually reduced an enormous amount of travel and cost tied up in that. And it's led, it led to us to question the way that we begin to provide our services and could we do it better? So I don't think it's all downside. Um, I think it often takes a crisis to force um, anybody to think differently about the way things are done. So I, I do see that as a benefit. Of course, you'd expect me to say, well, it's all austerity's fault. Um, and I'm, I'm not, going to, not going to respond to that really, because I think it is more complicated than that. And at the end of the day, what we are here to do is to provide services to local people that they actually need. And it's our job, the four of us you've got in front of you, it's our job to make sure that we do that with whatever resources we've got. So I think we do our best with that. Uh, and yes, it would be nice to have more money and it would be nice to do things slightly differently. And I think it comes back to Will's point that actually, if our government could fix the funding of social care, that would relieve an enormous pressure from local government. Um, and I think that is actually probably the key thing they need to do now and as quickly as possible. Um, because with that pressure released, um, we would certainly have a little bit more room for manoeuvre, but we'll wait and see on that one. Um, we've been waiting eight years, so I suppose we can wait a little longer. Thank you, Richard. Now, this is a question that has come up uh, a few times, and I think it would be useful to get a bit more uh, clarity on this. So the question has been asked is, um, you know, why can't we even open our own tip? Uh, it costs no money and fly tipping is increasing. So I suggest uh, perhaps if I ask Will to talk about the costs of uh, reopening um, a household waste and recycling centre. Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we've been faced with increased costs pretty much all the time since the beginning of April. So on the sur surface, you say, OK, so why can't you reopen something? Uh, there's got to be a limited cost to it. The reality about that for us is we've had a lot of staff who've been off self-isolating or who are shielding. And therefore, for every, every um, piece of activity we put back on, essentially, we're having to incur additional cost to staff that, to, 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 uh, to make sure we put social distancing in place. Um, and there's a cost to all of those, uh, those sort of um, activities. So, you know, we will, we want to get as much of that activity back up and running as we can, as quickly as we can. But certainly from my perspective, and certainly I know from Andy's perspective, we've got, we've got personal responsibility about ensuring that the council uh, uh, manages it finances sensibly and and within uh, the, uh, the legislation that's set out and we can't just incur additional spend that's adding to that 42 million pounds of deficit all of the time because actually that just that just creates that just creates more uh, a more deficit and makes it even more difficult to actually balance uh, uh, the budget and somebody's just said I think on chat aren't they paid already well people are paid already but if people are off shielding, you need to bring more people in to actually provide the service that you were providing before. So you are, we're incurring more and more cost um, every time we actually put, put, put something back in because we're not able to provide the service in the way we were doing it before the 23rd of March. A very simple example has been that when we've had refuse uh, vehicles going around, before the 23rd of March, we had three people in a refuse vehicle. Because we've because social distancing, we've only been able to have two, and that automatically then incurs additional cost as we've been collecting waste, and that that, that whole part of activity costs us more money over the period of time. So of course we want to put those those activities back in place, but we need to do that in a financially sustainable way.
thank you. I think that's a really helpful um, explanation there. So I, I see that we're coming, which is what happens if we can't balance the books? Um, so perhaps if I go around the, the panel and you can each answer that. Uh, so I'll start with um, Will and then Andy and then finally to, to Richard. Will. Yeah, look, you know, it's a very it's a very simple equation, right? That's the law. If we don't meet our financial responsibility, um, as happened in Northampton, as happened in various other authorities, UK government would appoint commissioners to come in and run the council. Uh, they would basically mandate us in terms of what we could spend our money on. There'd be no local decision making on, what, on, on how we could spend our money at all. We would be under very intense scrutiny for a prolonged period of time. And I would suggest that's not a place that any council wants to be in. Okay, just to add to what Will said, I, I completely agree. It's not a place you want to be in. Um, Thank you, know, you Will. Recovery, Andy? Yeah, our, our recovery plans we put forward um, do set out how we will balance the books, whilst they do use reserves. I really wouldn't want, as finance director, us to get into a point where we're we become overly reliant on reserves or into that, that place where we can't finance our outturn. So I would get to that place where I need to consider a section 114 notice, which is a public notice saying that the council can't manage its own finances. And as Will said, commissioners would come in and start making decisions for us. That for me is uh, you know, the last place I want to go as finance director. I really want to work with our um, cabinets and all of our managers to make sure we've got a credible set of recovery measures that we can manage ourselves and also continue the dialogue with government so um, we can prevent a section 114 notice. That's my absolute intention. Thank you, Andy. And Richard? So when we came into office last year and uh, Dina gave me this job, um, one of the objectives I set out was that we would balance the books every single year of this administration until 2023. Uh, we did that last year. We did not overspend. We spent to the pretty well to the penny. We did not draw from reserves. And we ended the year in, in what we call a balanced budget position. That's what I intend to do for the remaining years of this administration. This year, obviously, is going to be a quite exceptional year. Um, but the measures we've announced will enable us to balance the books at the end of the year. And I intend to do the same in the two financial years after that, um, because one of the things that we owe to local people is uh, good financial management um, from the council and that we are spending the money that you entrust to us wisely. And so that's the public commitment I make, that we are going to keep the books balanced. Obviously, our job will be a lot easier this year if um, additional assistance comes from the government. But uh, that is the political objective, is to balance the books year on year so that the public can have confidence that we are running the council well and that we are spending public money wisely. So that's the task I've set myself and that's, that's what I want to be measured against. Thank you very much. Um, what I'd like to say now is that this isn't the end of this conversation. So tomorrow there is, um, uh, so scrutiny will be taking place over our financial recovery plan. So if you wish to, that would be another opportunity for you to uh, watch and find out a bit more of the detail. Uh, the papers themselves are available on our website, on the council's website, uh, and as on the 2nd of July. Uh, what I'll do is I will make sure that the details of those meetings are attached to uh, this uh, broadcast when it uh, goes out, um, so that you can then uh, access the papers and also those um, those broadcasts as, as well. So may I thank my panel for, for joining me today to discuss our financial recovery plan and also thank everybody that has watched now and everybody that will be watching on YouTube as well. So thank you very much.